Hi everyone, welcome to another uh, live stream of DocsGPT Live. This is a very special uh, live stream because we have very interesting guests and a lot of interesting news to share with you. Uh, today we will discuss a few interesting topics like generative AI in business, fine tuning strategies in AI. We will talk about leveraging AI incubators. And finally, we will finish with uh, talking about future trends uh, in AI and predictions as well. And then at the end, we will have time for Q&A session. So please submit your questions and we will also answer some of your questions that you left out in our Discord channel. So I have two very interesting guests with us, uh, Ayan and Kelly. Uh, they're both from a startup incubator called AI Forge. Uh, they're amazing, incredible pe people. So uh, Kelly, she's a deal flow director and she helped pitch many thousands of applications to investors, but now she's the one that actually gets pitched to. And with uh, Ian, uh, he has 15 years of experience with helping uh, young founders launch their companies in tech. Great intro, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, the first topic I wanted to discuss uh, was uh, generative AI in business and uh, the definition of generative AI is uh, uh, artificial intelligence that creates new content or data based on training data. And uh, it uses algorithms like general adversarial network, and it can be used in art, music, uh, documentation like us, or uh, anything else pretty much where you can get a good enough sample of training data. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, discuss the current state of generative AI. And uh, the first question will be, what do you think makes generative AI wave so special in comparison to other technological waves like uh, dot com boot, uh, um, boom uh, or cryptocurrency? What makes uh, AI so special and unique? Yeah, I can go first if you mm -hmm. want. Um, I think it's the pace. I mean, it feels like the pace of, of previous technological booms has been huge, but this is uh, pretty incredible. I think ChatGPT um, earlier this year, I think it got sort of a million users within a few days. Um, and you compare that to Facebook, I think it took them 10 months to get a million users. Um, Netflix took 3.5 years to get a million users. And then if you want to go really far back and think about the telephone, I think it was something like 50 years before everybody kind of managed to get a telephone uh, to make it worthwhile so you could call most people. Um, so I think it's the pace of change and the scale of, of what's possible. Um, but personally also, I think it's this, it's twofold. I think say the web, you know, dot com boom, the web, web boom. Um, I think that was very much about sharing knowledge, um, putting your knowledge on the internet rapid communication, ease of communication, whereas this is actually, it's giving you skills. It's taking away, you know, it's, it's able to replicate human skills rather than just knowledge. It's about actually being able to generate activity as well. So I think that's sort of a, a huge difference. Mm, absolutely. Mm. And what I think is that um, it can't be ignored. Unlike other technology waves, the risk of ignoring the generative AI wave is lethal to most industries and most economies and it's fundamentally transforming the way we do business and it will fundamentally transform most industries and it'll do this in two different ways it will create new use cases that were not possible before that will give the players that do that an unfair competitive advantage and it would also uh, turbocharge the labor force making all workers as productive as the model they're using so it basically turns any paralegal into an, a lawyer mm -hmm. Or it uh, brings up the standards for becoming a lawyer much, much higher and make it even more complicated. I remember I heard of this interesting example that back in the 90s, when databases were created and the internet was created, um, lawyers on average had one salary, right? I think at the time it was uh, somewhere around 30,000 in the US. And uh, the, the day the databases were created, there was a separation there were two classes of lawyers essentially there were uh, new kids from university who came onto the company who wanted to start out and their salary remained average but then the people who were uh, people with experience their salary went to hundred thousand and basically the reason for this is back in 90s to be a good lawyer 
you need to learn a lot of material. You needed to learn it by heart. But now all you need to do is to hire an intern who's just going to search in a database and find all of the relevant information for you and, you know, help a lawyer make an answer. So uh, somebody with exceptional skills gets uh, uh, essentially a much higher salary in comparison to someone uh, who's just starting out. So might create a separation like this as well where, you know, people have to keep up. Yeah. I also think it's um, it's kind of you'll be expected to learn more skills. So maybe your expertise were, was copywriting before, whereas now you've got, you know, generative AI that can make that process a lot more efficient, a lot quicker, can generate content for you, can get you 85% of the way there. Maybe you still want to put some personality into it. Um, although, you know, there are models that can you can tweak the personality even and the tone. So uh, if you put the right sort of coding in. Um, but I think with that, you can't just be a copywriter. I think then you've got to develop other skills and you've got to, um, yeah, you'll have to, you'll have to become more of a generalist, I imagine, and get incredibly creative. You can't just rely on that one skill to generate a living. So I think that's the impact that generative AI will have as well. So, mm. yeah, I think that now that we have these uh, amazing co-pilots, they're going to inspire us and help us be so much more creative. Um, we will need to learn new skills, which we still don't really know which one they are, which they are. Um, of course, people are talking about prompt engineering and all the different technologies um, or techniques we're using nowadays, but those will get out of date pretty fast and we, as long as we get tools to make us more productive. Mm. So the truth is we don't really know what the workforce of the future is going to look like. We know it's not going to look like today, mm. basically. Absolutely. And I really like the example with Copilot because it really shows us where the future is. And I really like the marketing move Microsoft makes because uh, it shows people that it's not a replacement, but uh, addition uh, to their skills and efforts. Um, and really, we have to think about real life examples that we have already with AI, because it's already being used. Generative AI is being adopted quicker than any other technology, probably. You have every single big tech guy, giant who somehow implemented it, somehow uses it, and companies, you know, Microsoft, Google, uh, everyone, everyone is using it. it it's, it's inevitable. Uh, so do you, do you have any interesting examples maybe from an uh, incubator or uh, examples that you know about industries of how this technology is being implemented right now or going to be implemented in a you know, near future? Because it's hard to imagine far future, but we already have some uh, yeah. examples. So two days ago, we were um, judging a startup pitch competition in the um, AI conference here in London. And the startup that won is a startup out of New York that is actually creating a foundational um, model around the human genome and using that to detect new diseases we don't really have a name for, but we know are there, and actually to generate the cures for those diseases. Mm. And apparently they've already done two of those and get the, getting the FDA approval already. So that's fast. That's amazing, yeah. So. yeah. But they will still probably have to go through all of the uh, trials. But so, so they use uh, human genome. So it might be like, uh, uh, you know, like the coronavirus vaccine where they use, you know, the genome editing thing. So I, I don't think they're using genome editing. Ah. Um, so but what they mentioned is that there's new laws that came during the pandemic uh -huh. that allow special fast track regulate um, regulatory approvals for yeah. certain diseases and certain things. And those are the ones they're focusing on. So they can re reduce the regulatory risk mm. on their creations. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Mm. And yeah, I think I think there's a lot of well, there's a bit of hysteria, isn't there, in the kind of general public's kind of imagination about what's going to happen with generative AI and this sort of switch to some of the negative use cases. But there's so many positives. Um, there's a founder I know in Manchester who's established a startup using AI to analyse and detect uh, sort of child labour issues in big corporations' supply chain. Um, you know, there's so many kind of great use cases that could benefit. Um, benefit society and you know using AI to detect hate hate speech you know so I think one of the biggest fears is with generative AI we can just you know hate speech or false information will just you know propagate at rates we've not seen before um, but actually AI can also monitor that AI can also help detect issues with it as well so yeah I, I think there's going to be some amazing amazing businesses uh, popping up soon yeah it's not already there Absolutely. I think 
uh, a lot of hate speech is being detected like in video games, social media through through AI. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's what it makes it transformational because we cannot ignore it. If they are using those tools to um, augment and amplify the hate speech, we need to use the same tools to stop it and fight back. So you're kind of forced to use them, either if you like it or not. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, and predicting, I think, supply chains as well, I think would be a big, big thing. And um, I, I, one one example is fashion. So predicting fashion trends and predicting, uh, I guess, buyers thinking of merchandisers, you know, they have to just try and guess, or, or long ago, they would have to just try and guess from their own knowledge, you know, what are people going to actually buy? Uh, whereas AI could potentially help uh, inform, you know, how much stock you you know, you create and buy, uh, reduce wastage, um, etc., which could you know help help. I can footprints. already see extremely good recommendational algorithms coming out of it. Mm. I know we have done some recommendational algorithms in the past, but I think uh, there are some smart ways you can probably use generative AI uh, for this because uh, previous types they were just uh, much simpler neural networks and there wasn't much reinforcement learning. But I think these days you can probably do a lot more of generative AI and recommendations. Mm. I think a good example for this is, and we're gonna see amazing things in the education industry, because now we are real co we're gonna have a private tutor, a co-pilot for every single child to allow them to learn at their own pace, but they will be able to generate content in real time based on the child's ability and help them raise their competences and just let them take as much time as they want and just deep dive on whatever they want. And that's a really good um, example of how a recommendation algorithm could be used with a generative tool to actually enhance a process that we couldn't do before because we didn't have enough teachers. Mm. Mm. I, I really noticed one thing in our community. So we basically answer questions on top of documentations. And a lot of people who come and use it are people uh, like students and some universities. And they do it. Uh, a lot because it's so easy for them to just di digest the papers. It's so much easier for them to digest big in amounts of information in textbook into mm -hmm. usable short snippets of information. Because, uh, you know, uh, for example, you're reading on one topic, it's probably connected at a few points in a book. And having a search engine that can basically connect all of them and digest them is a huge boost to productivity for students. Mm -hmm. I feel very unfortunate that I was a student before <laughs> this type of technology <laughs> existed. Yeah. Why well, used to use the glossary in the back to say <laughs> I knew these three questions are likely to come up. Look at those topics and look at those just those paragraphs in the book, which was cheating a bit, I guess. But mm. it's going to be that, but significantly better, I guess. So. Yeah. I guess the risk there is they need to remember it's not an autopilot and hallucinations are a thing. So they mm -hmm. need to check everything and make sure that this and, inspiring and information is true. That's a very important point because that's something that we deal with a lot. We even have a short guide on how to make sure the models are strict and they're strict to stay, stay true to, to the information that's within the context and they don't go outside of it. Mm. And that brings me to the next point with uh, next, next topic is fine tuning strategies. Mm. And uh, basically fine tuning is when you take a uh, your data set and you take your foundational model and then you can fine tune it to answer questions uh, in a similar style or on top of the information that it has learned in that data set. So for example, uh, if uh, we're talking about banning you know, uh, bad speech and so on in chats, then we can probably think about a good foundational model which just understands language and then feed it a bunch of bad messages that users have created in the past and fine tune it to identify it in a much, much better and efficient way. Uh, so uh, my, my, my question uh, here comes to a very important uh, point with fine tuning is uh, data, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of fine tuning is reinforcement learning. Basically users give feedback uh, companies collect this data and then we publish a uh, model. So like we did last week, we published our own model on Hugging Face. Uh, it's based on MPT uh, based model, which is open source, it's commercial uh, license. You can easily use it, anyone can use it. And same with our model. But uh, I notice a lot, even in open source community, many models that are fine tuned, for example, on instruct data. So good data sets expensive data sets. Number one, they are for personal use only, not for commercial. And number two, 
a lot of the time they stay private, very well fine-tuned model. So do you think, uh, you know, data mode in general, uh, it is a driving force for many companies to achieve, you know, success. Do you think it's fair and should uh, companies be more open to, to competition by providing, uh, you know, models that, you know, businesses can build upon? Or do you think it's like with patents essentially? Mm. Um, I guess it depends on the context and the type of data, I'd imagine. Um, I guess going straight to your point around fairness, um, I, I guess if there's if there's data, you know, that a company holds that could actually benefit um, society, say healthcare, you know, if they could use that data to draw uh, accuracy over predictions of illness and things with greater accu accuracy, I think they should have a duty to share it and or a moral duty, you know, whether regulators step in or not, um, I don't know. Um, and then I guess coming back to the data mode points around whether it's it's there to try and I, I guess companies are trying to keep a data moat, trying to keep their data private to have some competitive advantage. Um, and again, I guess it's highly context dependent, but if you're keeping it private and you've got, that means you're having limited interaction potentially with actual customers, with users. Does that mean then that the data ends up lagging on quality? Um, is something I'm sort of wondering. Um, yeah, what's the impact on quality? Um, and also, data freshness I've sort of read a little bit about. Um, you know, if you're keeping your own data private and you're using the same data set and you're not as open and you're not allowing more people to sort of engage and give feedback and um, does that mean the data becomes a little bit old? Trends and things change over time. So almost trying to keep it as a competitive advantage in, in today's kind of world is it actually a competitive advantage or should you actually open it up for your own benefit you know you think you think you're gaining a competitive advantage keeping it secret but actually it might be having the opposite effect you might be actually harming harming your model or harming your data so mm. totally Mod model drift is a big risk and it's something you need to be on top of the whole time and talking about fairness if a company like meta invested billions of dollars to generate the unique data set of all the conversations of the people in the world, they're in their rights to use it. But as Kelly mentioned, um, data is ephemeral. So the good quality data that's actually gonna give us a competitive advantage is the data that describes the world today and that evolves as trends happen. And as uh, the pandemic taught us and the war taught us and the uh, interest rates taught us, context changed a lot and really fast. So it actually will be, in my opinion, the data generated by your users and in your specific niche use case mm. that will give you that competitive advantage and not the generalist data that you use to kick off your model to validate your early assumptions as a startup. Mm. I really like your example with uh, focusing on generalist versus uh, specialist models mm. because I have this opinion of uh, fine tuning as creating those small Lego blocks that are extremely efficient at a small task. So, for example, let's say we live, you know, 10 years in the future and we have, I don't know, GPT-10 model that's so extremely advanced and it does so much work for humanity. Uh, how would it structure itself? Would it answer all of the questions itself or would it uh, delegate those same questions to smaller models that are more optimized and more efficient? So, for example, if you use GPT-4, Right, you probably have to have a lot of servers hosting it. And every single token, every single answer is very expensive. But if you compare it to uh, models uh, that are generally uh, you know, more specialist, the answers are much cheaper. And you can host it probably on a MacBook. Uh, so uh, I, th I think uh, you know, fine tuning and uh, creating specialist uh, tools that go into niches is actually the future. Mm. Uh. Yeah, I think we're we're thinking 80% of the founders we'll see in the future will likely be building on top of existing models and, as you say, tailoring it for specific issues, specific problems that are out there. So, yeah. And yeah, even if they then decide to take an open source model and fine tune it even further as a competitive advantage, it probably won't be that, that what they start with. It, they'll probably start with a generalist model. And then as they understand their business, under, as they understand the origin pains their users have, tune it towards that. Mm. Mm. I yeah. personally think, you know, there are certain dangers with really big models uh, and it's hard to measure them, hard to understand them. 
but once you do have a uh, sort of uh, restricted access, you can easily mitigate those. Uh, because for example, if you send an extremely advanced model out in the wild, you might have bad, bad actors with it. So at the end of the day, I think it's like, economy is like a nature, you know, and with GPT models, with businesses building on top of them is gonna be, you know, a kind of nature as well, where extremely advanced models, they're probably better kept behind the doors. But a uh, good foundation for a base model, uh, you know, it's also good to keep it open source and maybe, you know, put it behind the doors just to keep certain level of advantage in business. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we um, spoke last week or the week before and you were talking about your community and how engaged they are um, in, in your product and what you're building, yeah. um, that was really kind of insightful and you see it as a huge benefit that people, that you're, you're, you know, you're more open, um, the benefits that come from that, which is fantastic. And I think like community, it sounds cheesy, but it kind of is the way forward and mm -hmm. that kind of engagement, not just from a... I think it's also from a product market fit perspective, isn't it? You know, as well, it's that kind of feedback loop um, at the same time. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that um, it's becoming apparent to all of us that open source is the way. And most of the um, foundational models we will be using in the future will be open source. And of course, the ones we're going to niche off from them will also be open source. So that's going to be super interesting. And the other interesting thing we saw is that um, when um, Meta's model leaked, um, mm. Lama. they won because everyone built on top of it. But so it's they not actually commercially. Can you com can you commercially use it? Yeah, but imagine you're a researcher at Meta. Mm -hmm. How much did you learn during those few weeks versus how much you learned during the previous months to towards that? Of yeah. having all the people working on your model. I think like what I really like cases. is GGLM project. Um, basically, when they quantize the model. I made it run on a laptop. I, I can spin it up on yeah. my MacBook. And that's crazy because if I were to think about other, many other modules, you know, I'd probably have to rent multiple H100 cards. Yeah. And that's expensive. I think they went as far as to get it running on a s cell phone, on a single cell mm. phone. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that it's still not commercially available. We can't use it as a business, but having the world tinkering with the model gave them a competitive advantage that it, they would never have if it, it would have remained closed. Mm. Mm. You know, the whole Transformers, I think it was uh, invented by a uh, research team in Google originally. Yeah, it's a Google paper. But what's fun is how other companies through this paper have taken advantage and built certain things. And then through this long feedback loop that spanned, I don't know, many years now, they're building BARD. They're building yeah. assistance in their own ecosystem because they saw other companies trying to do it. And now they're thinking, oh, that's how we can apply our technology, actually. This yeah, I, I think they started a bit before November. Um, I would say Google started their um, AI first transformation about seven years ago. Hmm. And the transforma Transformers paper is the consequence of them focusing all their energy towards that. And it's what enabled the rest of the industry to, to create this um, mm -hmm. Cambrian explosion of value and of uh, new use cases and new technologies. So in a way, we do owe um, everything we have right now and the speed we're moving to that one team and that one paper. Mm. We do have one question about the just DocGPT model. How does it interpret feedbacks given by users? Would you be able to share your process on fine-tuning the model with uh, the feedback? Uh, so um, the feedback, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. That's pretty much the most straightforward way for us. And we just uh, ingest it into the, you know, fine tuning process. We also try to pre-select some of the responses, make sure they're good quality, they have all of the fields, uh, everything we need. And uh, we fine tuned it on four 800 uh, processors, four 800 GPUs for three hours. Mm. Uh, was incredibly hard to find 800 GPUs. It's probably the hardest thing to, t to find in the world, especially four of them together. It's lucky to find one, but four, it's, it's, it's near impossible. Uh, so uh, next segment I wanted to discuss uh, is uh, actually about uh, AI Forge. It's about leveraging uh, AI incubators. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's a special time and you have 
uh, a perfect opportunity to secure all of those uh, interesting uh, uh, pieces of technology and uh, secure interesting people and you are in the right industry in the right time. And uh, can you tell me more about uh, AI Forge? Yeah. Yeah, shall I, shall I go first? Um, yeah, we're um, an incubator working with really early stage startups uh, building with AI. Um, so we're kind of sector ag agnostic, um, you know, working with founders who are most likely to be at ideation. Um, we run a 12 week program three times a year um, and we take between 10 and 12 startups per program. Um, and yeah, we kind of, the 12 weeks cover kind of everything you need to get your business off the ground really quickly um, from financial modeling, but uh, product market fit, um, mentor, uh, you know, uh, kind of hooking you up with mentors, uh, the right mentors who can give you the advice and guidance you need subject to kind of the gaps you've got in your knowledge um, through to pitch training um, and obviously AI. So we've got a great CTO on board. Uh, he's got a massive team of developers. So he'll help look at, you know, the tech roadmap, the AI roadmap um, and help actually get you an MVP by the end of the program, something to show investors because a big part of the program is um, introducing the founders to lots of investors, angel investors, venture capital firms to help them raise that pre-seed amount of funding. So um, our target is to get 85% of founders that go through the program funded to the tune of £200,000. Um, and I don't know if you know much about the government's SEIS scheme, but it's basically a, a scheme to um, create a really so, great... So that's the way yeah. we... UK right now is probably the perfect environment mm. to secure angel investment. And yeah. how does the SAS scheme work? Yeah, so it kind of protects. So if you're an angel investor, you want to invest, but you're kind of a little bit nervous. It's a high, always high risk this early stage. Um, but it protects their investment up to fifty percent. I think the, the figure is. So if you invest, if an angel investor invests, it goes it goes wrong. You know, startups are risky business. Um, it protects. They get they get fifty percent of their investment back. But also, it's really tax efficient. So um, so the business does brilliantly. You know, they make some money from it. Um, I don't think they have to pay any tax. Don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but it's it's highly tax efficient way for UK investors to invest in really early, early stage businesses. So it encourages investment. Um, and they've, they've put the ceiling at £250,000. So a startup can get up to 250 And those investors who put that money in really benefit from, you know, from the things I've just said. So... Yeah. yeah, it lowers the cost of capital, so it um, increases the risk the market is willing to tolerate, okay. allowing a lot more riskier ideas to flourish and test and experiment. And uh, regarding the program, um, maybe the interesting thing that we figured out in, in the last few months is that this is not a technology problem, this is a human problem. How do we find the right problems to point this technology to, and how do we help these highly technical teams to navigate all the human aspects of creating a company, finding the clients, and actually creating the product that uh, they need to be creating to close those deals, close those clients, and get their investments. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, um, well, I, I worked for an incubator before this this one as well, and uh, and I think it's going to be even more so uh, with AI Forge. Um, and I know Ian, you're sort of really passionate about this as well, but. You know, you kind of start, you talk to the founders before they join the program. They're like, what's the value of it worth in, in figures? You know, we estimate it's worth £100,000. You know, we give them £10,000 when they join to help with living costs. They might be giving up their day job or their freelancing gig for the first time. We help them focus fully £10,000 towards sort of legal fees and professional services, etc. Um, and then 100 hours of developer time. But when they come out of the program, you know, the one thing they state and they're most passionate about that they rave about is the community and the ecosystem. They're like, I never would have had those introductions. I never would have had that support. I never would have had those perspectives had I not gone through the program. So and it's harder to quantify, you yeah. know, it's just sort of a more of a qualitative kind of, uh, you know, example. But that's something they all I was really surprised they'll come out raving about, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I always find it fascinating how the more seasoned serial entrepreneurs value the soft value and the connections and the mentors and the access to the clients over any investment they could get through a program like this. Uh, whereas the newcomers actually get um, interested in the securing of investments and realize that the soft value is worth so much more after they finished. Mm. Mm. And maybe something to, to talk about our program is that we focus on 
helping the founders understand the things that usually kill startups in the first few years before they reach Series A, and actually systematically study and practice and mitigate those risks one after another to make sure they have uh, the best chances and set them up for success mm -hmm. uh, once they r receive that investment and start growing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's really incredible. The community is extremely powerful. And, you know, I, I noticed that a lot of successful uh, programs that are focused on startups, they, they focus on uh, the quality of community. And another thing that I think is really powerful is uh, the team in the incubator itself I is because, you know, a lot of the time you hear that investors, all they want really is a good team. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't really care much about many other things, but once they find talented people, they're always going to be on their phone. They always can message them. They always can interact with them. They're always going to be interested in their ideas. And the same, I think, goes for, uh, you know, incubators, funds, anyone who is investment industries, you want somebody sort of holding your hand through important moments of growth. Mm. And especially those people being focused on AI, having understanding of this technology is going to bring a lot of important input into, uh, you know, young companies in general. Mm. Yes, and I think there's an, a really interesting um, feature or facet that a lot of the founders, successful founders share is that they're able to successfully um, interpret and leverage feedback and actually go and seek for that feedback from their mentors. And it's those founders that are, will use the resources at their disposal and the mentors and will ask the investors for help um, that will succeed because they have that positive feedback loop that allows them to grow. And in a context like uh, AI, and especially now with the boom of generative AI and the, the arms race and all the big macro tsunamis that are happening, uh, there's so much feedback and so much valuable information for them to use and channel, channel mm. that um, they really need to be able to do that. Mm. I saw the structure of your offerings, right? And one of the biggest uh, benefits that strikes to me is the amount of you know credits mm. people can receive. Because from my perspective, right, running an AI company, your biggest cost are servers. Getting those A100 cards, there is a competition. If you offer a higher price, you're more likely to get them as well. You really want to get onto those reservations for H100s if you want to build anything interesting in the next few years. And if you look at cost distribution, isn't majority of the cost of a young company uh, gonna fall into uh, you know, servers? Creating the data mode with the fine-tuned data creating your own foundational, uh, sorry, your own fine-tuned model on top of foundational, or even using foundational model and paying certain fees. Isn't isn't majority of the expense right now purely on, you know, hardware? I don't think so. Because when a company is getting started, mm -hmm. there's two things. First, there's amazing support by the ecosystem, by all the large cloud developers. So you're able to secure the credits in the different cloud ecosystems to secure those cards. Again, you, you need to prioritize um, and to get them, but you got the credits to pay for them. And the other thing is that the first challenge as a young team is to actually identify who are your clients and what the urgent problem you're trying to solve is. And you don't re necessarily need to go out and fine tune a model to do that. You do that once you already found these, this. So I would call it it's step two or maybe three and not step zero. So you're able to secure investments without really fine tuning a model at all. Mm. Mm. Interesting perspective. I really like it. Okay, let's move on to the next section, which is uh, future trends and predictions for the industry, which is very hard, mm -hmm. nearly impossible. Who could have predicted the situation we're going to be in, I don't know, a year ago? I, I think it was very hard. People saw GPT-3 model a year ago, just to give a reminder, I think uh, maybe a year and a month or two ago, a GPT-3 model. And, and people were impressed, but a lot of people said, oh, it's just... Simu simulation imitation of human language it doesn't really have reasoning but now we're coming to chat gpt gpt4 it's showing us incredible abilities to process information and think and uh, i i just i just think nobody could have predicted nobody yeah. could have predicted it so uh let's discuss um uh, uh emerging trends uh so i think there are two uh you know, you know main directions and you mentioned it before is generalistic models versus uh, uh, highly optimized, purpose optimized model. I personally, I think uh, there's going to be a world where we have both, you know, foundational models, or oh, sorry, big generalist models that will probably provide guidance 
to smaller purpose-driven models, uh, purpose-optimized models. And, and what's your opinion on it? Yeah, I think um, that is what it's going to happen. And once we understand where the value lies, we're going to start creating really specific niche models and fine-tuning them deeply for those specific purposes. And the reason we're starting with generalist models is because they allow us to explore the world and to do a lot of testing super fast and super cheap to understand uh, where we should aim those resources. Mm. I think it is p pretty clear right now that um, turbocharging the knowledge economy is the, the big win and it's where most of the value will be. But which specific use cases and which specific industries and which specific type of workers are we going to help and how um, is the question, right? Mm -hmm. I like your phrase with experimenting with generalist models because I think that's even how we started. We started purely on ChatGPT model. Uh, not even ChatGPT, we started on GPT 3.5 DaVinci, uh, if you remember. Uh, sorry, it wasn't GPT 3.5, it was GPT 3 Instruct DaVinci, 003 or something, uh, I still remember it. And we saw that it really does provide answer on top of documentation, it wasn't perfect. And back then we were thinking, hmm, you can fine tune DaVinci actually on uh, OpenAI's platform. And we thought maybe that's the way to go. And we saw that the costs are so much bigger for fine tuning. And then the time went by. We started experimenting with Llama. Obviously, it was released a uh, month or uh, a half later. And uh, we realized that you know fine tuning is the way because you can quantize Llama. You can run it on smaller hardware. You can be more efficient. And that was really the vision, still the vision for us is to continue with uh, deploying those highly optimized models and uh, making sure they go really, really well. Yeah, I think it's speed to market as well, isn't it? I think it's capturing that market share quickly. And if you can just fine tune an existing model and move quickly and equally, I think that's how an incubator can help in 12 weeks. You can, you know, achieve a hell of a lot. And, you know, there's a there's a speed to market consideration as well, I think. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a definitely a first mover advantage. Mm. And if you can be the first one to create a community and to actually ha generate a brand around something, you might be able to win even if your model is worse and your product is worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because people won't, will not give um, an equal opportunity to the second and third models, which will mean that you will be able to actually leverage the data from the usage to fine tune your model from your users faster than the competition and that compounding competitive advantage will allow you to win. I. I, I really like your idea, but at the same time, what the trend I'm seeing, right? We, we basically answer questions on top of documentation. And I see other companies approaching me, some of my clients approaching me, and they're building niche solutions, very niche, very, very, very niche. And I think those are the real winners, to be honest. It's not us, it's the very niche people who interact with the community. We all engage with each other, but at the same time, they're probably going to Mm. But which saying, success quicker than uh, we will in that particular niche but yeah. in all the other niches no so again you're, you're an inspiration engine for them mm. true so you have your own value yeah absolutely and um, one thing I wanted to mention going back to the, um, the compute scarcity we have right now something we have to keep in mind is that uh, luckily most of the macro trends that generated the the compute crunch the fact that we don't have enough chips to process as fast to do inference as fast as we'd like to and to train as fast as we'd like to um, are getting solved and in the next few years we will have more chips than we can use or actually more chips than the, we currently guess our projections we'll use we'll probably miss those projections as always and need more mm -hmm. I but think so, that's yeah. car mm -hmm. that scarcity is not going to last so all of a sudden we're all going to be able to secure compute power at the same time so right now, those that can secure compute power have an unfair competitive advantage. So think Google, they own the, their mainframes and their, their cloud centers and Amazon and uh, Microsoft Azure. Mm -hmm. They do have an unfair competitive advantage, but that won't last after we all get access to compute. Or people who have reservations on those GPUs. <laughs> I bet there is a queue, you know, I, for... Yeah. But again, it's because you have a partnership with these companies mm -hmm. that you get the, those reservations. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's like at a certain point, if you're a successful uh, tech business, you do become a, a bit of a hardware company in a sense that you have your servers, you have your connections with people who make the chips, 
you probably even make your own chips sometimes, you know, uh, not, not produce Pretty them, hard. but uh, like M1 with yeah. Apple, which was, I think, absolutely ridiculous how efficient they are. Yeah. Well, you, you saw that trend in the um, blockchain industry with the miners. They ended up producing their own ASICs. Mm -hmm. And that was on, when they started, no one even thought that was possible. Mm. Uh, that's a very good example. And I think there is an ASICs to be discovered in terms of uh, AI still. Yeah, for sure. We're going to be using ASICs soon. We already are with the TPUs, Google's TPUs, mm -hmm. but they're going to get more and more prominence. But what I find uh, troubling with Google TPUs is um, uh, many open source models, they, they don't really run on them. Because uh, the ASICs are limited compared to CPUs or GPUs. Mm -hmm. But it's in that limitation that we can actually make them cheaper and faster. Mm. So it's a trade-off, right? True, true. Th that's a very good point. That's a very good point about the trade-off. And I think I have to agree with that on that. Uh, agree with you on that. So my other question, and it's opinion that, you know, circles around frequently, and I really like how you arrived to this point, is because will uh, people with the largest supercomputer win? Don't think so, again, because it is a competitive advantage now. And those companies, because it's going to be not people, it's going to be companies, it's going to be countries, mm -hmm. will have access to those foundational models. They will not share. Those mm. will be proprietary and they will use them it's themselves. more geopolitical now. So those, those tools, those assets, they'll use themselves. And the whole supply chain that comes from them, they'll keep it for themselves. They'll not share it. So you won't really be competing against them. It will not be a competition at all. But for the rest of the people, because there's going to be a lot more access to computes and we'll all have strong ASICs and access to GPUs if we're still using them by then, then we'll more or less have an even playing field, let's say. Mm. So the question is, are you going to running as fast as you, your competitors or not? And will those um, countries or big companies like um, mm. the Metas and the Googles be your competitors? They'll not be your competitors. They'll be out of your class. So. Not because really. sometimes when you do reduce access, when you create those autarky economies, which are secluded from others, what you start figuring out is that you have your homegrown monopolies that stop being competitive. And competition is really what creates, uh, you know, a strong, uh, strong company. So Yeah, but again, when you put uh, national security into a mix, it all gets complicated. Look at the ARM deal with, uh, with NVIDIA, what happened? Mm can get tricky really fast true that's very true it can get very tricky and i think uh lots of people in uh you know certain ministries are realizing how important that technology is going to be in future for them as well and companies like palantir are already deploying solutions and showcasing them to everyone mm -hmm. uh, um, that's so a scary part <laughs> yeah that's a very <laughs> scary part that's a very scary part you know, uh, I really do hope that one day we're going to have a very nice AI overlord <laughs> that's going to look after us and have best motivations for humanity. Yeah, probably do a better job than uh, what uh, our current governments are doing, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Brave new world for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, just a bit out of context, I didn't even plan on this, but I remember we discussed it with Kelly uh, mm. uh, privately, is that um, in future, right, uh, we will probably have um, very, very advanced AI systems that will sort of govern policies, govern uh, governments, make decisions uh, instead of politicians. But I think we will have electorate college of people who fine-tune that model and uh, decide on what kind of primary functions it op optimizes on and what kind of things are priority for it. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's important to go back to the beginning and say it's a co-pilot, not an autopilot, and we're still accountable for its output. Mm. Mm. But I think in the beginning, obviously, it's going to be an autopilot, oh, sorry, a co-pilot, you know, especially for policy decision making, right? Uh, like right now, right? Uh, you probably have a good economical justification for uh, a decision, right? But then, uh, you know, it, it suddenly becomes political. So at the end of the day, maybe maybe we will always have politicians around. Mm. Well, I think they go against science quite often already, don't they? Uh, you know, I think they've been shown 
scientific evidence for certain to, to say you should make this policy decision and they go mm, but that won't be popular with <laughs> certain people who are our core voters so we'll go against it um but yeah if, if ai could play more of a role i think we'd have better decisions definitely yeah, maybe it's harder to make a biased ai than to have a biased politician <laughs> yeah that's a good question which yeah. is more biased <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely and and we've already seen that um the politics industry has been disrupted already, I guess, since the Obama campaign. Mm. And it just keeps getting disrupted. So what the politics of the future will look like, uh, we don't know. Mm. We'll just have to find out. Oh, it's going to be really hard predicting it. I think the algorithms are already getting so good. I think it's hard for people to understand if the choice they're making is out of their own free will. Mm. Uh, you know, I think free will is a bit overrated. The more advanced the models become, the more I question my own free will, you know. Uh, I always thought that, oh, our consciousness is so special, my reasoning skills are so special, right? Um, I, I thought of myself as a relatively smart person, and there are obviously some geniuses in this world, but one day there will be models that are genius level. I mean, if you think of it, even GPT-4 is genius level because it probably knows more information about things than we do mm. uh, already. I think it asks the question, what is intelligence? Um, I studied this long, long ago. I studied psychology and th there wasn't like a consensus on what intelligence is. And it comes back to what is consciousness as well, I think. And um, again, many years ago, uh, there wasn't agreement on that either. So um, is it at genius level? I guess it depends how we would assess that. Would we, would we go with the usual uh, tests, which are usually quite Western and quite through a certain lens and still don't quite like an IQ test. It feels like it doesn't quite capture intelligence and specifically is from a specific lens. It's a test developed years ago. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if actually the development of AI will eventually shed light on what is it to be human and what is it to be intelligent? You know, will, it, will we suddenly have an aha moment when it, uh, you know, I, I don't think, know. I think what we're asking here is actually what is human intelligence mm. right because intelligence in general may be you know uh, something uh, and uh, i don't know the model already does and then the next question we start asking with ai is uh does it you know ca can can it pass the turing test mm. you know the models now now they actually pass the turing test uh when i was a kid i remember i was thinking oh w will i still be alive till the day the models pass the uh, turing test and now i'm clearly seeing that they're doing it pretty mm -hmm. well so what's next how do we measure consciousness now yeah, <laughs> yeah. well something I, I was fascinated to see is that our first assumptions when this started happening last year is that this is going to destroy creative work and what we're realizing now is that actually creative is at premium because this is um, making us all as cognitively powerful as the model. Mm -hmm. So it's actually our creative skills that allow us to use the model in different ways that make us super model users, let's call it. Mm. So creative people are winning rather than intelligent people that went and studied for 20 years and memorized everything in the books. Mm -hmm. I, I think now they can iterate so much quicker, yeah. but I still think knowledge and understanding the fundamental is important. So I really like the idea of Copilot. Uh, for the near future, I think Copilot is pretty much what people yeah. have to teach themselves to do. And if you want to gain a competitive advantage, right, the Copilot is probably the way to do it. So uh, in terms of just models in general, I had this uh, question about, uh, you know, licensing and regulations. Uh, and, you know, do, do you think it can sort of stop innovation? Uh, do you think it can create monopolies? Do you think it can, uh, you know, uh, for example, right? Mm. We were talking about generalist models and I can see a world where they're sort of becoming dangerous, not now, but maybe sort of in your future, near future. And I understand the premise of regulating highly advanced AI, but at the same time, if we start regulating them, will we block other players from creating their own extremely advanced models. Yes, I think, um, and this has been discussed a lot recently, but I think we cannot not regulate them, but at the same time, we have to be responsible stewards of technology and regulate them in a way that does not stifle innovation or does not put um, an unfair competitive advantage on the large giants or even uh, certain countries. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing, again, with all the open source work that's going around is that this is gonna be an open, um, sorry, a bottom-up revolution and even if you want to regulate it, you can't really stop it. 
So we need to find a way to reconcile those, reconcile those, those, um, those two um, things and just regulate it in a way that does not send the smaller players to the dark parts that are unregulated and potentially dangerous, but at the same time does not le let us or let bad actors use the super intelligent models to um, be a threat or a problem. It's, it's a balance that we have to figure out. It's a hard balance. We need, to, again, it's, it's so disruptive as we talked before and so transformational that we are actually forced to regulate it properly. There's a really, really important um, responsibility on the regulators, unlike with other technology waves like crypto, for example, to actually regulate it properly and fast mm -hmm. rather than just um, do it whatever their lobbyists or whatever their boats or base want them to do. Mm. Mm. And I guess regulators are usually very slow. So this is a very interesting time as yeah. they try to catch up. Um, I think some of the people who are calling for regulation perhaps are doing so for the wrong reasons rather than the right reasons. I think I've seen um, they're scared of falling behind. Maybe they've got market share or are leading now in some way, and they yeah, kind of that go, could oh. be a big issue. Yeah. yeah, and that that's often what happens. You know, uh, oh, we'll call for regulation for the good, but actually, uh, it's because they think oh, I don't want this. This is I know I can see how this is going to disrupt me, yes. you know, my industry, and I want to remain the player, the key player. Um, so yeah, you're in really interesting time. I know the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK is looking at this now. They published a paper in, I think, April. So I haven't read it in its entirety yet, but they're looking at data moats and you know, do they what do they do about it? So you know, uh, imagine we're gonna have AI that basically uh, lobbies inside the governments, writes the emails <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> looks at personal history of the politician, links him back <laughs> to some story about some neighbor he knew <laughs> yeah. and how AI has affected him personally. Because I think, you know, it's powerful tool for manipulation of yeah. politicians as well to make sure we're regulated yeah. to stay competitive. All the more reason for them to be educated on the subject and for us to actually regulate it properly as fast as we can. Yeah. And um, I agree with Kelly that it's really interesting to see how the different players take their stances. Some of them are, uh, oh, this is an opportunity to catch up, so let's regulate it. Others are, um, let's play ball as fast as possible because if we do, then we're going to have a better chance to help guide the regulation in a safe way. And others are, if this is super regulated, then we are the only ones large enough to actually keep innovating at speed within a heavily regulated industry. So it's going to give us an unfair competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So depending on, on whose lens you're looking for uh, through, there's difference um, of obviously agendas and motivations for what they want to do. But uh, beyond all of that, we do need to regulate it properly and Absolutely. fast. Yeah. yeah. OK, I think we can go into audience questions. And you can guys submit your questions. We will answer them live. And there have been few questions that were actually addressed to you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question, uh, what is the AI Forge application process? Yeah, it's um, you uh, You can apply on our website. Um, you fill in a few questions, uh, upload a pitch deck and a, and a video as well. So you can introduce yourself or use the video space to sort of talk through your pitch deck. Um, yeah, so you submit your application. Um, then the next, so that's kind of stage one, if you like. Stage two is then an interview. So um, that's very much getting to know you as a founder. What drives you? Um, what's your experience? Do you have some natural ability or some previous experience that would show you'd make a great entrepreneur, a great founder as well? Um, and the third stage is a judging panel. So we've got some AI experts on board uh, from academia, from industry, who are going to help the AI Forge team um, judge who should make it in so we'll, we'll whittle down the applications we get through to a short list of 30 then there's a judging panel uh, and then we we whittle it down to either 10 or 12 um, startup founders um, and yeah so you'll get the, the idea is throughout the process you'll get lots of feedback so it'll probably be quite um, competitive um, we're expecting sort of hundreds but it could could go into thousands of applications potentially um, but from the judges you know from from AI Forge from the judges we're hoping to provide really constructive feedback um, throughout so you should gain some expert knowledge from from these judges um, but even you know even if you don't make it in the first time um, where it's not we don't want to have like a binary yes no if someone's expressed an interest in working with us very often the reason they don't get in is just that it's just too early 
you know, they've got a great idea, but they haven't necessarily gone through the ideation steps or done enough market research to kind of validate that this is this is legitimate. So we want to do some work around kind of what we call pre-incubation. Um, so, so founders who are promising, we like them, but they're just too early. Uh, you know, come and join some some uh, courses mm. uh, and then maybe try and apply again and see how far you get then. So That's very good. It's like a uh, little, uh, you know, evening school to help yeah. uh, young founders uh, build their idea and then apply. So it's like kind of literally helping them the whole way through, even even if they're not in a, a community yet. Yeah, yes. I believe in being really transparent as well about how we're evaluating. So making sure that's clear so people know what we're looking for, what to include in their application and pitch deck. So mm. I'll be releasing some information about that. So, mm. uh. yeah, and uh, one thing we should note is that applications for our September cohort are now open. And mm. the cutoff date was? Uh, it's the 14th of July. So, yeah, but sooner you apply, the better. Um, yeah. Uh, another question uh, that we have is, uh, what are the requirements to apply? So just pitch deck, mm -hmm. video, and uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, there's a few additional questions. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to, it's, it's in person, so I don't know if that came across, but it is in person. Tuesday to Thursday, so you have to be able to attend in person for all pre-planned sessions. Um, it is intensive. Um, it, we want people who are highly collaborative, um, willing to learn, willing to work with us, willing to partner with, with us, really. We see it as a partnership. You know, We're partnering with those founders to, to really help them. Um, but yeah, there's the application form pitch deck. Um, I think having a really good grasp of the problem and having done some market research and research into the problem is crucial um, as, a, as a starting point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And something else is that you don't necessarily need to apply as a team. You can apply as a solo founder, but we're getting a lot of experts, domain experts from business and actually um, really visionary technologists with deep knowledge on AI that are coming to us and telling us, I want to start something. I just need a team. So we're, we're also getting the opportunity to get people together get them to start talking and through this pre-incubation process actually help them validate the idea mm. before they apply. And um, mm. yeah, it's really interesting. So another question is, which industries or markets will be first to be disrupted? I think we can say most will be disrupted, but <laughs> yeah. which are gonna be the first ones? I'd say high tech is already being disrupted. Um, high tech. We can all agree that Google got blindsided. Mm. That's as disrupted as it gets. <laughs> Mm. Banking and finance mm. also, uh, mo mostly because the, um, of the decrease in their costs, their operating costs, and the speed at the which they do things. Education is going to be disrupted for sure. Healthcare as well. Maybe I already a bit see how education, tutors, and just so many things are getting. I think universities will roll out their own AI tutors, to be honest. Yeah, for mm. sure. They need to supercharge the teachers. And um, also media and entertainment, for sure. And maybe some of the more regulated ones, like... Um, banking or insurance or healthcare may be a bit slower, but that does not mean that they're not being disrupted right now. Mm. It means that we'll see the impacts of that a bit later. Mm. I, I think uh, in terms of regulated ones, uh, it depends on where you will apply your model. Because for example, as far as I know, if for example, you have a fraud detecting uh, mechanism and you are trying to uh, integrate it with a bank, the first question they will ask you is, uh, why did it make this decision? And they need to be 100% sure into the reasoning. So they will never disclose it to a customer as to why, for example, they were declined a certain transaction, but they need to internally know very, very well because they need it for audit that's gonna be yeah. external. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that opens also another industry that doesn't exist today. Well, it does in a way, but AI infrastructure is gonna be a massive space and we're actually expecting a lot of applications. So um, tools to do watermarking to identify synthetic contents, tools to allow us to do audit trails through um, GPT models to understand actually what data was used and from what data set at what time it was collected for this particular um, recommendation or to answer this particular prompt. All of that needs to be created. Even the networking stacks today, we're still using TCP IP and that's not strong enough for what we need. We need to rethink everything. Mm, I, I I I agree. You know, the, the maybe uh, you know. I'm, I'm I read recently an interesting uh, article about some matrix transformations at a, at a scale, and that AI actually came up with an answer to it that was, you know, so advanced and so much more efficient to the way we even handle uh, matrices transformations right now. So maybe the same thing can be applied to even 
base things that we all got used yeah. to, like networks. R&D will get supercharged for sure. The scientific process is going faster. Mm. So next question is, uh, are GPT models just predicting or imitating? And imitating, do they actually have uh, capacity to do any proper reasoning? Well, I guess this is one of the biggest misconceptions, right? And we had really highly educated people that knew their subject that fell into the trap to believe that these things are actually reasoning. Um, what the model does, in essence, behind a lot of really complex mathematics and really complex compute power, is predicts predict the next word, predict the next pixel. It's just predicting based on everything humanity taught it through the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's really powerful predictions, but they're still predictions. But as you mentioned before, uh, isn't your brain doing the same thing, just predicting? Yeah, so it's because as babies, that's how we learn. Yeah, We learn just like the models on examples, a lot of the examples. Um, so another question. Uh, Alex, can you give some info on the model you guys posted? Uh, is it hard to try it out? Uh, it's uh, it's not too hard. You just need one 800 GPU, or you can deploy it on uh, many, many other GPUs because it uh, actually is quite compatible. Um, so any powerful GPU that has more than 16 gigabytes of uh, VRAM will work. Uh, so yeah, if you want to try it out, there is a link uh, for Hugging Face, and uh, you can uh, make sure you know you connect it and keep all your data private. Don't send it to OpenAI. <laughs> uh, so some other questions that were related more to um, uh, Dog's GPT product uh, itself. Uh, so caching uh, LLM calls. I think uh, you can easily add that layer in application via Redis. Uh, but also, uh, it's it's efficient to cache, uh, and I really like uh, some projects that basically cache semantically as well. And I think that's really cool if you cache semantically. Uh, we don't do that yet. <laughs> uh, how does DocGPT implement streaming function? Does it do MapReduce? Depends. If you want more context, you do MapReduce. If you don't have enough context. Uh, we don't do MapReduce be before, we just answer uh, immediately. And that brings me to one limitation, which is uh, context. Context is very limited, mm -hmm. but Anthropic AI, 100,000 context. And the next model we're going to publish, and we're already training it and working on it hard, is going to have 50k tokens context length as well. Uh, so I think... Uh, uh, just one more question, guys, because we're uh, running out of time now. Uh, do you think ChatGPT4 or later version will keep startup uh, based on common use cases like chatbot, content summarization, etc.? Uh, mm, Could you repeat the question? Do you think ChatGPT4 uh, or later versions will kill startup based? Uh, on common use cases. Ah, so startups that are based on common use cases like chatbots, you know, like uh, Zendesk or Drift or so on. I, I want to add to this, I think they themselves will integrate it. They will yeah. themselves will be the disruptors. Yeah, I think startups are going to be the only ones agile and fast enough to actually deploy these tools at speed and they will be disrupting other people. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's been really fun meeting uh, with you guys, I, I, we've been incredible guests. Uh, I think uh, the audience learned a lot and uh, I'm sure uh, there will be interest people who are interested in uh, building companies who have certain ideas, who have certain ideas about niches, they will absolutely love applying uh, for a project. So in description, you'll be able to find links to uh, AI Forge and to Docs GPT as well. And uh, what are your final thoughts and advices for businesses who are interested in implementing uh, generative AI? Um, yeah, I think um, just start start moving. I think start start testing, um, start engaging with who you think who you think your customers will be. So, if you've spotted a problem, um, start talking to the people who have that problem. To test is it really a problem? Uh, kind of go and do that market research. Um, and I think just starting those conversations and start testing, build quickly, start testing. Don't wait till it's perfect. Uh, just just move quickly. 
hundred percent. Get out of the lab and start now. Don't don't wait mm. because the window is now. Yeah, mm. and people people want to talk. I think that's the people want to give feedback. People want to engage. Uh, I think is the key as well. Yeah. If you ask people for their opinion, they're often very happy to engage and willing to give it. If you want to test some things out with them, so yeah, community community yeah. is incredible power. Yeah, and especially we see around open source is that community is just you know self driven thing to be honest. Mm. But I think it goes beyond community. Even if you go to the large legacy companies, mm -hmm. you talk to the employees, you talk to the executives, they're all willing to innovate and try and talk to the new startups and new innovators because they they know this is going to be transformational and they know they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So they want to partner with these young companies and these young professionals, um, or not so young at times, but they want to partner with them to understand what's coming and what the future is going to look like and mm -hmm. discover it together. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, it's been really fun talking to you guys. It's been really fun having you, uh, asking questions, and uh, I appreciate you guys a lot. And please subscribe, and uh, have a great day, guys. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Sorry, I have to press the end on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect.